Hello, hello everyone! Good evening, good morning, good day, wherever you may be in the world. I am Hans, and I will be your host for the next four days. You are now watching Save and Sound, a celebration of music and games. With over 16 hours of content from 70 plus developers from all around the world, we have something truly special for you. Just right now, we also have an exclusive Steam sale 
So if you check out saveandsound.io, you will be able to find over 150 games and soundtracks on sale just for you to try out. And of course, you know, we're running this lovely little show that starts at 7 p.m. CEST, 10 a.m. PDT, every day until Sunday. Now, let's talk about tonight. The lineup is pretty insane. Struggling, Worship, Where Birds Go to Sleep, Retreat to Enon, Negative Atmosphere, Absolute Tactics, Daughters of Mercy, The Forest Quartet, Project Warlock 2, Against the Storm, Jupiter Moon's Mecha, World for Two, Toem, Rain World Downpour, The Season of the Warlock, Everhood, Unpacking, Coromon, Nitro Kid, Frostpunk, and South of the Circle, and Project Arrhythmia. We have about four and a half hours of showtime just for you tonight. So, without further ado, let's present the next block. This whole show is presented in little blocks. So we have about six tonight. We'll have six every day. Uh, and then after each block, you'll find me again in this lovely little set. Up next, Struggling in Worship by Chasing Rats with a beautiful musical performance by Leandre Monet and his band. Then an audio deep dive by the developers of Where Birds Go to Sleep. Then some insight by the composer of Retreat to Enon showcasing some peaceful tracks. And then we'll see each other after those segments to see what's next. And now let's move on to the content. See you soon. There you are. At Chasing Rats Games, we humbly think of ourselves as connoisseurs of the fine musical art. As such, we take the utmost care in this area of expertise while developing our Hunnish games. We would like to thank once again Save and Sound for this opportunity to share with you our craft at its most deranged way. Enough of my blabbering. Let the show begin. <laughs>
Thank you everyone for listening. My name is Leon Monet, composer at Chasing Rats Games. I had the pleasure to perform the music of our games with my beloved musicians. If you'd like to know more about what we do, you can follow us on Twitter at Chasing underscore Rats. Struggling is available on Steam and on consoles. The game is as wild as its soundtrack. Trust me. You can also wishlist worship on Steam right now. It helps us out in so many different ways. Anyways, thanks again, folks. And I wish you all a wonderful night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. You beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, you beat that fish, you begin to take it, Pas une crise cardiaque. Hello everyone, I'm Martin from Quiddle of Feet, working on Where Birds Go to Sleep, a cinematic narrative adventure game. Today I want to talk to you about our music in the game, which has a little bit of that oriental tinge. And uh, even if you don't know much about music, this is going to be very interesting for you. So let's get into it. The main topic today is holistic music composition. Big picture thinking about composing, how I think about composing music for where birds go to sleep. What I try to do is create a set of conceptual tools to help me compose music consistently. This was very enlightening for me. I hope it will shed some light and demystify how music can be made. There's many different ways, I don't always follow this exact process, but it's one that's very useful and easy to get started with. I'll try to avoid as many technical terms as possible. So, what really makes a song? What even is a song to you? What makes a good track? The answers are going to be different for everyone. I don't want to think about notes, harmonies, chords with weird names, Bisa 7, or, you know, thinking, where do I start? What comes next? No. Let's think about the big questions. So what's, uh, what's the absolute, barest minimum, the simplest way I can explain what a song is for me? Well, what I found is a song is really two things. A melody and the atmosphere, the immersive quality. We talked about a holistic, non-micro approach to designing, in this case, uh, composing a song. But that doesn't mean details don't matter. Quite the contrary, everything matters, every single note and sound builds the song. But at the end of the day, we are listening to a song as a whole. We're not listening to an isolated note or a part. We are looking at a painting, not at a brushstroke. Here's an art example. This is a complicated picture. Or is it? I can say, wow, I like the colors, but do I? Let's look at the colors only, and you know, I don't know about you, but to me, that doesn't look too good. Let's remove the colors. I still like it. Reducing it to three values, or two values of gray, the information, the pieces I liked are still there. Everything else is just ornamentation, which is very important, but it is just that. Back to music, two big concepts that govern my process are melody and layers. Let's talk about melody. I invite you to think about music and about melody without playing the melody. That's what I did and I found a funny concept in music called scales. What are scales? A scale is a set or a pattern of notes that go up or down in pitch. It's like stairs, you can go up or down the stairs or you can skip a couple of them every now and then, but if we keep going they just repeat like a pattern. You can also swap the scales while you're playing a scale, so the possibilities are endless, really. A practical example. 
Let's take a single one note as our bass line. Now imagine this note is our bass line that we want to dance around. We can cross it, go up, go down, but at one point we have to return. This is a scale. What's important is that now we have a pattern, a guide we can roughly keep to. Because where our birds go to sleep is set in a mystical Near Eastern setting, I was looking for a scale or a set of notes that we all recognize as a little bit exotic, a little Eastern. I played around and came up with this. This scale is some variation of an Eastern scale, or so I'm told. I'm sure it has a very complicated name, but we're not concerned with that at all. This pattern does everything I need and more. When you think about it, the beginning sounds similar to the Prince of Egypt theme, which uh, I hope you're familiar with. So, we have our bass tone, we have our steps traced out in the scale, now we're ready to make some melodies and music on a guitar or a piano, but not quite ready to record and make a track to the quality that a modern audience expects. Let's have a look at layers. I'll employ a common design technique of a 1-2-3 read. That's what layers are about, 1, 2 and 3. We will divide our song into three layers. Why three? Realistically, we only need two, but three is a magic number in design. One is a constant, two elements give us contrast, black and white, for example, but no subtlety. And three elements have the contrast between one and three, and that in-between stage of two to help us express more complex ideas. In audio, we also have the bass, the low deep sounds, and we have the higher pitch solo instrument, like a violin, or a piano, or a woman singing. Let's take a look at how I choose to think about layers. The third layer is going to be our fill layer. Here we will put our drones, the low sounds, the percussions like drums or what have you. The first layer, the melody, this is going to be usually a higher pitch sound from a guitar, violin, or a voice. This is the layer that sings. This is the part you're going to hum or remember when you think about a song. And finally, the second layer sandwiched in between. What do we put here? Supporting melodies, instruments, anything goes really. This is here just for complexity, to create interest and depth. Think about layers not as specifics, but as big concepts that can house multiple instruments and sounds. Let's make a simple track quickly to show you the process. This track is evil, angry, but the subdued, calculated sort of hatred that bubbles beneath. I will want a rhythm that's a constant, which is usually not the case for Eastern music, which is full of ornamentations and breakups in the rhythm. I think it will work though. I had an idea of an argument under pressure. Two voices arguing while the clock is ticking, a dialogue of sorts. A lower monotone repeating pattern and a higher, more expressive female swapping places. Then at the end they can join and talk over each other and we barely understand what they're saying. Frequencies going crazy until the time is up and nothing gets resolved.
I talk about voices, I just mean the guitar making different sounds. I don't mean actual voices. First, I'll select the bass note. I call this a bass note. It's actually not the root note um, for musicians out there. My bass note is sort of the same in all of the tracks of Where Birds Go to Sleep for consistency. Here is the bass melody. Now, let's put in the fill. And finally, the ornamentation, which is the meat and potatoes of this song. It is a bit overwhelming, but this music is made to be in a scene in the game, not really to be listened to by itself. I hope you found this entertaining and interesting, and if you like the way we design our music, you'll definitely like our game as well. Check out Where Birds Go to Sleep on Steam. Thank you for your time, and take care. My name is Justin Hosford, and I am the composer on the upcoming open world survival game, Retreat to Enon. Retreat to Enon is a survival game with relaxing elements. It's a hardcore survival game, but there's things like meditation, uh, and there's no monsters or anything. It's all about being in nature. So while I was writing this score, I spent uh, as much time outside as I could. Um, I also did the sound design for the game, so uh, I would oftentimes go for hikes or to beaches um, in rem remote locations and record sound effects and think about what I was going to do musically. And I had the luxury of time, so I spent um, over a year on this score and at this point there's over an hour of original music um, and so much of that uh, was conceptualized actually out in environments that remind me of uh, some of the environments that you see in the game itself.
I decided pretty early on that um, some some vocals, some ethereal kind of atmospheric vocals would be really cool on this score. So I reached out to a longtime friend and amazing artist, Jen Grady. And I basically sent a couple of really simple tracks to her and I said, just sing um, a couple of simple, catchy and, and pretty melodies over the top of these. And then I basically took those and used them as themes and wrote a lot of the score around those. This is one of my favorite pieces um, from the score, uh, and I'll, I'll start by playing the original theme that I wrote and then some of the full uh, orchestration. Thank you. 
So with a game like Retreat to Inn, and, um, which is more relaxing and, like I say, has things like meditation, it's tempting to just go with sort of a, almost flatline the experience with just sort of that relaxing vibe. But I thought that with the lore of the story having uh, some sadness in it, where this takes place in the future, and this is kind of post-apocalypse, but in, in a bit of a positive way, I thought that having uh, elements of emotion, sadness, and hope kind of intertwined along with the relaxing elements uh, to try to give the game more of an emotional connection and a dynamic that uh, the player will feel more bonded with their experience and more immersed in the environment. Hello again! I hope that you're enjoying the show. I am your host Hans, and you are still watching Save and Sound, and I have not moved since the last time we saw each other. Production has actually super glued me to this chair. Anyway, Struggling has a sale running through the duration of this event until the 18th on the Steam page. Um, if you go on the front page of Steam, actually, uh, underneath the big banner, you will see Save and Sound normally. Maybe you have to scroll in the carousel a little bit, but please do check that out. Worship is available for Wishlist, and so is Where the Birds Go to Sleep, and so is Retreat to Enin. So please add those to your Wishlist to support the developers. Up next, we are going to space, specifically with Negative Atmosphere and how Sunscorch Studios intricately crafted the audio for this creepy and surreal survival horror title. After that, we'll have a conversation between the creator of Absolute Tactics, Daughters of Mercy, and its composer. And we'll end this block with the Force Quartet showcasing some behind the scenes footage of how its jazz soundtrack was recorded and some exclusive gameplay. All right, that's enough for me. Uh, let's go to the content. See you soon. Greener Holdings welcomes you to your personal utility computer for use aboard the Rusinov. Please verify your identity to continue.
Sierra, need some help. Where to now? Data links suggest there is an elevator nearby, Doctor. It should take you back to medical. Okay, I got it. I'm gonna have to figure out how to get through here. Warning. Drug reservoir empty. Here we have the voice for the personal utility computer, or Puck for short. It can provide you with information about your surroundings or your character's health and inventory statuses. So up in the top, we have the voice recordings that I have done, and then in the bottom are the same lines, but processed through effects. Doctor. 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 Edwards. 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 Behind you. Behind you. Continue straight ahead. Continue straight ahead. Harmful substance volume detected in blood content. Harmful substance volume detected in blood content. Overdose detected. Seek medical attention immediately. Overdose detected. Seek medical attention immediately. Alert. Shipwide power fluctuations and outages detected. Attempting to trace source of local disruption. I think these sounds are a good example of the effectiveness that can be achieved by using a simple yet powerful tool. Reverb. We'll start by listening to the full sounds and then we'll go through each of the layers and break it down before and after. First up we have my vacuum cleaner. And with reverb. Then uh, I love doing this technique where I've taken myself doing some really weird breathing. And then I pitch that down. Put that through some classic reverb. Gives it this really nice effect. But then we have a mechanical switch. Gives it a little bit of accentuation on the start. Then some metal rattles. And another vacuum. metal lots of metal in this game Having that rattle gives it a nice sound of when the power generators fail, you, you can feel the metal shaking around you.
Then to enhance that power down effect, I have a synth playing a sine wave in the really low end. So make sure you've got some good speakers or headphones to be able to hear this. It blends nicely with vacuum sounds. So yeah, once more, showing the whole thing. Attention nearby maintenance personnel. The shielding for lifeline X84B has been ruptured. Proceed to the designated location immediately. Here we have the sound for the lifeline and the bridges that intersect it. The lifeline is a kind of giant ventilation shaft that spans the length of the ship and also carries all of the gas and liquid pipes that supply all the different sectors. So beginning we have the metal creeks for the bridge itself. Then some nice wind ambience. And then I took the sound of a mine shaft and pitched it way down and stretched it way out and you get all of these really cool metal shrieks and kind of extra ambience to put on top of the wind. And then lastly, I took uh, recordings of myself doing some really weird breathing. Uh, sounds like this originally. And then pitched way down. You get this really eerie atmosphere.
And then all together we have the sound of standing in the middle of the lifeline. Here we have the voice for the combat robot known as the Gladiator. The first step is taking lines from our voice actor, Kai McKenzie. Identifying Dr. Samuel Edwards. Warning, security breach detected. And then that gets processed through a synthesizer, turning it into something much more menacing. Identifying Dr. Samuel Edwards. Warning, security breach detected. Dr. Samuel Edwards, intruder alert, intruder alert, be on guard. Dr. Samuel Edwards, be alarmed, hostile entities detected. As a bonus, I want to demonstrate the importance that mixing can have on a sound. So here we have two identical voice lines from the Gladiator. The yellow is unmixed and the blue is mixed. The unmixed is how it sounded when I originally created the voice effects for the Gladiator. Identifying Dr. Samuel Edwards. Warning, security breach detected. And then I realized that that wasn't quite as impactful as it could have been, so I went back and took the same sounds, but just enhanced it with audio engineering mixing. Identifying Dr. Samuel Edwards. Warning, security breach detected. Oh, that's more like it. Danger, a large hostile entity has been detected nearby. Proceed with extreme vigilance. Personnel. Oh, shit. What's wrong 
of this door. Sierra, get me out of here! Caution. Local device is corrupted with malware. Attempting to regain control. Come on, Sierra, let me out! <laughs> So here we have some vocal snippets of the Stiltwalker enemy. We'll hear first our voice actor, Kai McKenzie, who's also the same person that plays the protagonist, Samuel Edwards. And then we'll hear the same sound with all the effects that transform him into the Stiltwalker. Let's go. Hello, my name is Jason Shields, creator of Absolute Tactics Daughters of Mercy. Today I'll be speaking with composer Thomas J. Peters, and we'll be diving a bit into the music of Absolute Tactics, how it affects the game, as well as some more information about the game and the source of some of its inspiration. So for starters, I knew that I wanted a bit different audio vibe for Absolute Tactics. There are a lot of gothic tones in the game, so I wanted the music to be dark, but have a unique feel. So Tom, I feel like I gave you the incredibly difficult task of scoring an RPG without using very many stringed instruments, and instead focusing on more hammered and world instruments. How was that to work with? I, I actually loved that. I, I thought that that, for me, was a real, that's a real treat always when you can kind of venture out of the orchestra a little bit more. And, and for this game, it was about finding the real culture of the music and just figuring out what's what's the culture of this world and it ended up kind of becoming this this uh, mix of the uh, the dulcimers were the jumping off point and then it ended up becoming this mix of a bunch of world instruments the more nordic type of style but uh, mixed with the uh, Middle Eastern elements, yep. so sort of mixed with the santur and the um, yali tambour and a lot of these uh, these cultures sort of coming together to create this unique uh, landscape for this game. Yep. So it could kind of feel like it had its own uh, traditions and voice to it. Yeah. One of the things too that was a neat idea that kind of came out throughout this process was a lot of games do dynamic instruments that sort of come in and out. Because ours is a tactics game and has very set sort of phases between like player turn and, and enemy turn, um, we were able to kind of like come up with this idea that during the enemy turn we wanted the music to sort of take like a darker tone, and during the the, the player turn, which tends to be a little longer because the player's thinking and, and planning, um, a little bit more chill, a little bit more heroic vibe. So some of the instruments would sort of change a little bit to be like a darker sort of you know, throat singers and, and sort of deeper instruments on the enemy turn and then during the player turn a little bit more, even like trumpets and things that 
were a little bit more like heroic and sort of uplifting. Yeah, that's one thing about this game is there's some pretty dark themes in it. It's it's on one hand a completely sort of light-hearted, fun adventure, but on the other hand, it's there's some. I mean, the bad guys are bad, so it was really important when they're sort of invading these villages or burning down, a, you know, the town. Like it, it really felt, you know, you felt that in the music. So. Oh yeah, and I remember our, one of our first uh, creative notes that you made that was just perfect, where <laughs> you were, where you're like, uh, I think. In it's this scene, the there's a dead body in the river. Right, right. And I'm not <laughs> sure this is really working for this. Yeah. One of the things you brought was the uh, the voices, like the throat singers and the sort of <laughs> ethereal, uh, angelic voices, which was really cool. And mm -hmm. something I wasn't expecting, but once it was there, it was like, oh my gosh, we have to use this as much as possible. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it was almost in the Danny Elfman sort of vibe that I felt some of those higher voices were like, wow, this is a really neat slant that you don't hear in games so much. And I was, anyway, that was cool. That, that kind of took on a life of its own as we were sort of working through stuff. Sure. favorites and I definitely but but I have so much appreciation for the man's music and for that style of using those uh, uh, the female voices in the lead and, and having those uh, those like minor thirds he uses like these minor thirds with the female voices and it has this very eerie <laughs> chilling sort of beautiful quality to the yeah. to the sound and, and I remember specifically that <laughs> the piece that that happened was when we were doing the church music. And it ended up becoming kind of the Crystal Caverns, used that a lot in the Vortex level. Yeah. And a lot of those ended up incorporating the, uh, mm -hmm. the voices. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of optional missions in the game, and a lot of the optional missions tend to be remixes of story missions. Not all of them, some are unique, but... And so, like, we could reuse some of those, some of that music in a way that was like, okay, you've been here, you remember it, and this music is tied to this area. Like, I didn't, like, I didn't feel bad about reusing music in that way, because this area has this sound to it, and when you come back here, it still has that sound to it, and, you know, so that was anyway, a way we could also, you know, save a little production, to be totally honest, but, um, mm -hmm. but a way that these areas could sort of have this theme and song to them that, you know, was, was tied to that area anyway, so. <laughs> What's interesting about that too is that that central theme, that piece didn't it didn't occur to me until the until we were working because we were working kind of rather sporadically on the levels. And yeah, we'd have one that's like near the end of the mm -hmm. game and then one that's Absolutely. way near the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and so we had one that was in a very huge moment with the horses, mm. with the horses scene. Mm -hmm. There was that theme. Uh, I wanted to make it as memorable as possible for that moment because it was so significant in the mm -hmm. story. Because mm -hmm. you had this huge, I guess, a huge battle yeah. coming, and uh, that was the genesis of the main theme. As I started to think about, well, who are these people fighting for, and you know, what's the significance behind the, these characters and their struggle against you know these forces of mercy? Yeah, yeah. And that was neat, like you, like you mentioned, to sort of tie in the music with things that are actually happening in the scene. And the horses, like you mentioned earlier, were the same kind of way. I wanted that sort of, the the, um, the hoofbeats rhythm of the horses to, to be the tempo of that. <laughs> yeah. That technical uh, thing that we had with the, with the horse clomping. Yeah, yeah. As I remember, that was that was a struggle when we were trying to get that in, in tempo. Yeah. With the tune. So here's what's funny about that, too, is I, I, I nailed it. It was like, okay, perfectly in sync got the horse clop, clip clops like perfectly in sync and then here's what's funny it goes to QA quality assurance at Occupar and they're like this is weird that all the ho hoof beats all the horses are, are running in sync with each other like, you know what that is kind of weird so then I had to sort of like offset half of the horse horse clip clops to be kind of like on the off beat it's, and actually works almost better because they don't feel quite so like stiff but but yet it still matches the so anyway, there was a funny QA note there that's like, all the, th the thing that I worked so hard on was like, this feels weird. I, I guess it kind of does. <laughs> 
when you sent me that animation of uh, remind me of the character's name again. So, it's been so long. The three sisters from the game are named after towns in Kansas where I grew up. So there's oh, that's awesome. Yeah, there's Lenexa, Galena, and Eudora, um, and they're all towns sort of near where I grew up. So anyway, we're Eudora back. Mercy. Yeah, so Eudora <laughs> Mercy steps up and plays the organ on the church level. And uh, when you sent me that initial animation, I actually I spent a good chunk of time. I'd say probably about an hour or so of just like, okay, it's not there. It's not oh, that wow. tempo. It's it's not wow. here. It's not there. And I, I kept thinking, like, okay, so we need a piece that's going to have sort of that, like, Bach type of mm. sound. Or, you know, more fugue, I guess. It's more of a fugue type of sound. And so, and the piece itself is is a little bit, it, it's got the, the antecedent and con- consequent phrases that are often uh, used in fugues. And uh, the you know, counter subject and counter subjects and, and whatnot. And so that was a lot of fun to do and to sort of channel my, my inner... Um, uh, Bach composer, <laughs> just appreci- appreciator of, of this um, this very gothic style of writing. Yeah, yeah. Which I just love so much. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a, a gothic theme to pretty much any game I ever make if I can help it. So I'm glad you're on board for it. Yeah, and so uh, you have uh, her playing the organ during this entire bit and yeah. I loved that yeah, I loved yeah. that that it was incorporated into the musical score yeah and yeah. sort of how you could have that diegetic seamless sort of marriage of that in score when we got to the uh, vortex level was mm. that that was a very uh, interesting challenge as well with nice. the layers yeah 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 that. bunch of weird time elements and right yeah so um that one that is lenexa mercy yep that's the one she's in over the big giant vortex of doom and <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a lot of like weird floating islands and sort of spinning debris and stuff and uh, and yeah we, that one needed to just be weird frankly it needed to just be like <laughs> like as weird as we could make it while still sort of fitting in the style and uh big like waves of like interesting sounds and stuff which were perfect yeah yeah it was a lot of uh, the music in that was very uh, was ins- kind of inspired by shepherd tones and uh, sort of like musical spirals because you wanted to get that it was actually really inspired by like sort of you know that that uh, spiraling down type of thing in terms of the almost like reverse shepherd tone oh, cool. always exciting for me to hear you reference rock music because that's where like my heart is is sort of that late 80s sort of gothic music of the cure and nine snails like i put the funny man jesus mary chain there's a lot of these kind of bands that were like have no business in this game game production with you thanks great pleasure jason awesome. it was a lot it was a lot of fun and i can't wait for people to play it yeah I'm very very excited i can't wait to play it myself so awesome, man.
And we're back, everyone. Uh, make sure to wishlist Negative Atmosphere. Absolute Tactics Daughters of Mercy has a demo available right now on the Steam page, and so does the Force Quartet. 
So go play both of those titles before the demos disappear into the abyss of the World Wide Web. Coming to your ear holes next, Project Warlock 2, a heavy metal and retro FPS with a deep dive into the game's composition. After that, Against the Storm, a fantasy roguelike city builder, and we'll be following the sound designer into the audio decisions and techniques. Then, Jupiter Moon's Mecha, a futuristic tactical deck building rogue light with a deep dive and gameplay piece. And the final segment of this content block will be World for Two, with a lovely little classical piece of their soundtrack featuring a piano, some violin, some bass. It's going to be lovely. That's, off, uh, that's all for me right now. See you on the other side. I'm not real. Hey, my name is Jerry Lear, and I'm one of the two members of Absolute Audio. And I'm Luke. Welcome to Absolute Audio. into first person shooters specifically i know you've you've done a lot of mods and level design and stuff but how did that tie in with your uh, music approach i think wolfenstein probably was the beginning uh blake stone from seven all those and then it was a shareware or a shovelware cd that had just a bunch of shareware on it just taken from the internet for free that they pulled and i saw level editors for doom and I saw those, and then I went out and bought Doom specifically to make levels, and I just have played it since. That's that awesome. Like way back in 94. Were you like me? Were you putting CDs in the computer? And I was listening to Metallica. I was listening to Ride the Lightning. What did you do? Did you like, did you make music for it and I, shove it in the game or I what? I had uh, basic MIDI music, mm -hmm. and so did Doom. Wolfenstein was more like, World War II sounding stuff, but I would a lot of times mute the music or just have it quiet and then play just old grunge from the 90s, just whatever, house and change, whatever I was listening to. Yeah. When did you start using Acid, the non-LSD type? When, when did you start with Acid software? In 2000, I found it at Best Buy. It was around like 200. I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And then I, I was already using a few softwares that weren't quite the same thing it was just like sound recorder i didn't even plug my guitar in for a half a year until i just it dawned on me i could do that i was awesome. just chopping up loops but yeah 2000 and then orion popped up in 2005. so let's check out the video that you did for acid real quick um you kind of went through and showed off a session what's the song that's in acid i'm sorry there's you got two video clips what's the one in acid Acid, or, uh, forms. And is that one going to be in Project Warlock 2, or is it still being considered? Uh, Cuba had heard it, and he liked it. He said he's starting to fall in love with it, so he asked for it. So I'm not sure. I'm imagining so. <laughs> That's a big one. It's got like 90 tracks or something, right? Yeah, 95. Cool, let's check it out. This is the first software program I ended up using fresh out of high school. This was called Acid. I bought it from Best Buy in the year 2000 and uh, started plugging my guitar in, my keyboard in, and chopping up royalty-free drum loops. And I'm going to play a preview of a song I have submitted for Project Warlock 2 called Angel With Horns. That was just the intro. And as you can see, there are 95 tracks on this guy. Some of them are muted, mind you, but I spent a lot of time back then and I still spend quite a bit trying to perfect these things in Acid once I take them out of Orion. But back in these days, I hadn't discovered Orion yet. Let me go ahead and play <clears throat> pre-Orion keyboard. Uh, there should be a track on here somewhere. Key B, yeah. 
Uh, let me give you a little sample of kind of the solo that I had used in a couple things and then settled on putting here, but this is from Project Warlock 2. But this is acid. So, so tell me, what's the big difference for you between Orion and acid? I used acid a long time ago, but I've never used Orion. I thought it was more of a, uh, it's like a doll with a with built-in plugins. Or tell me about that. There is a lot of software today that probably does both these things, but it is a doll, or uh, acid is a doll. It doesn't. I mean, it has many capabilities, but. When it comes to Orion, I use that because a lot of things that I want to do, you can't really play on the keyboard with one person. I mean, if you're not like Mozart skilled, you can't do a lot of the arrangements that you can come up with in Orion. It's basically piano. It's more or less a spreadsheet that you paint notes on. You can play MIDI, and I've done that to, you know, get the notes down, and then it basically is unlimited what you can do. That's really cool. And if you, you know them so well, because you've been using them for so long, so. I only stick to those two. Yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. So let's check out Orion. Uh, tell me about this song that you've got going in Orion for us, this video clip. It's called Struggle Street. It's kind of a new remix of something I made in 2005. And I just consider it one of my favorite tracks that I've ever done in it because of how many notes, I guess, how elaborate it sounds. It's not really Warlock 2 material, but I figured I'd share just to show off the software. All right, this is Orion. This is the second software I picked up kind of in college, 2005 era, when uh, I was in classes, we were making video games. And I kept getting picked for audio, and so I figured I'd broaden my horizons a little bit. I had a little free time. I wanted to find something that sounded like Nintendo, kind of where you could chip tune, use chip tune, paint notes, stuff like that. I ended up just using regular synthesizers in the long run, but it was for a space shooter that took like four weeks for them to make, leading up to an overhead kind of dungeon Zelda type game where I used the same software and made more. Uh, back then I didn't blend it with acid much and that's what I started to do in Project Warlock 1 was I took the old software acid and I took the new software Orion and I kind of used them back and forth to get uh, the final drafts of a lot of the songs which ended up coming from back in this era that I had didn't end up using for anything and I felt they were too good to just leave alone. So as long as they fit a Warlock 1 theme where I could bend them to do so, I used them. This is my favorite track that I made back then. It's kind of been remixed, remixed a little bit recently, but it's still the same notes, it's still the same setup. And I would like you to hear it now. And that's Orion. All right, now you tried to get me into Reaper, but I seem to be stuck in ancient software I'm more familiar with. Can you describe Reaper for an unuser user kind of sell the software? Uh, it's it's 60 bucks for a license, it sells itself. Um, I can't crash it. It's super user friendly, it's super developer friendly. There's so much uh, material for, uh, for learning it on YouTube. Um, you can do anything you want in it, it it's, I, I was Pro Tools certified for over 20 years, and Pro Tools went to a subscription. I went to Reaper. I never looked back. I had less problems. Um, you know, and there's nothing wrong with ancient software. I use ancient synthesizers. I've got an MT32 sitting here and an FBO1. 
And if MT32 means anything to, to anybody watching this, you, you know what I mean. It's, it's the old um, sound module for the for the Sierra games. Like um, you could actually get better sounds playing DOS games with the MT32. And I hooked it up, and I like some of the sounds. It's a rolling synthesizer, so um, it's definitely not user friendly. So um, I've got to have some user friendly and convenience, and Reaper spells that out for me. Are there any plugins or uh, BSD instruments that you favor in Reaper? I use uh, I use pretty much exclusively stuff from Arturia. Their synthesizers, their V collection, it's on number nine now. And I really like the Fairlight uh, plug-in, the old the old computer sampler workstation. It was like the first touchscreen monitor. Um, it had eight-inch floppy disk that would load like one sample and it had a touch screen with a light pan. It's really awesome. And um, it's just a lo-fi, grungy, um, it kind of limits what you can do. So you work in a certain flow and it, the song that I'm gonna showcase, um, I used it quite a bit. I got the drum sound, uh, the bass, and, and some of the string sounds out of it. Um, the song's called Chicago by Night. How did you come up with the title for the track Chicago by Night? When you picture Chicago by Night, like a like a grungy city full of it's it's from a, a role-playing game called vampire and uh i never played vampire but I always enjoyed the title titles are important to me so um when you picture chicago at night and the idea of vampires roaming the city i get this real i don't know imagery or sounds in my head and um the fair light was perfect for it so you'll hopefully that translates in what you hear um in the song okay so here we are in Reaper I'm not gonna show you every single plug-in or whatever or my entire workflow for this track um, here's my mastering chain real quick I almost exclusively use IK multimedia for most of my my processing plugins my synthesizers are usually Arturia or Korg and the Arturia Fairlight CMI is all over this track. So it's one DX7. You're gonna hear the Fairlight on the bass, the keys, this whispering sound, and um, the drums. So I'm just gonna play it, solo some stuff, let you hear it, and uh, then we're gonna move into a section I used Sample Tank 4 um, to create, and um, hope you enjoy it. So as you may have heard there, the drums, they sounded a little bit out of time. And I think that's primarily because they were. So I apologize for that. What's interesting about the Fairlight is you basically 
you step record inside the plug-in. Um, this is one of the first touchscreens with a light pen, and it's finicky, just like the old hardware version. So rather than draw the MIDI notes in Reaper, which I've done with, um, so, which you can do on some of the other tracks with the Fairlight, um, I, I opted to do it inside the plug-in right here. You can see you have to do it with a mouse. You can't even play it. So it's super awkward. It's super finicky. And when I updated, for whatever reason, it didn't, um, the preset. I blame my tools. What can I say? So the next section is kind of fun as well. I use Sample Tank for that one. And I'm just going to let it play. Um, you're going to hear a choir. You're going to hear a timpani. It's the same sort of theme, um, but with a little bit different attitude. So, again, I hope you enjoy it. So we'd like to thank RetroVibe, our friends at Buckshot Software, fans of old school retro first person shooters, uh, everyone at Save the Town. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Where can you be found online, Jerry? I run a website with too much stuff, uh, www.lear.me, uh, feed the Twitter, and uh, the RetroVibe Discord. Right on. Yeah, um, you can check out theabsoluteinaudio.com if you want to hear some more of our watch music on his website. He just mentioned I'm on the Discord. Join our and, and uh, come hang out with us. Uh, uh, we're happy to answer questions, talk about games or music or whatever. So thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you soon. Hi, my name is Mikolai Kurpios and I'm responsible for the production of sound and music in Against the Storm. It's a roguelite city builder developed by RMI Games. The player's task is to settle the unknown wilds and manage the growing population of beavers, lizards, humans and harpies. By design, Against the Storm is all about embracing the challenge and playing the hand you're dealt. So in this video I'm going to take you through some of the challenges I had while working on the game. Uh, show you how I tried to work with what I had and how it influenced my decisions in four categories music, ambiences, sound effects and voice acting. 
let's start with what I knew before I even started to work. Uh, I wanted to create both sounds and music on my own, especially taking into account that for a long time the project was made after hours on a zero budget by a five person team. Uh, the plan was to work on the audio layer of the game from the early stages of the development and continue it over years as the game was planned to be released in early access. And possibly the most important part, there was an assumption that players would spend up to dozens of hours in the game, so player fatigue was probably my biggest fear. Uh, summing those up, the main question was how to create an interactive and immersive audio structure while not imposing too much fatigue on the players and how to plan it well in order not to lose too much time in the process. Firstly, I was interested in how the team imagined the soundtrack. Uh, all the soundtracks they mentioned as a reference were based on piano, strings, flutes, harps and other classical instruments. Some of them were recorded by real orchestras and instrumentalists, but the majority were produced with old VSTs. I was happy with this fact as I was pretty sure that we wouldn't be able to afford to record live instrumentalists. Also, I didn't want the music to sound too classical because graphically the game was abstract in some way. Uh, in my project I mainly used the classic VSTs from East-West libraries. For me those were a sweet spot between the sound of a real orchestra and older VSTs as they are a little outdated now. Uh, in terms of the effects I mainly use a lot of reverbs and filters to make the music more spacious and blurry. Here's how my project looks like. So let's go through my VSTs. Here you can see a few types of drums I rarely used, then different synthesizers, free bass layers, free piano tracks, free harps, glockenspiel, a banjo, clavichord, five types of flutes, a Tibetan horn, some brass instruments, various types of strings, and three tracks of female vocals. Uh, down here we also have some audio tracks like bird sounds, my whistling and voice recordings usually transposed down. Uh, here's the ukulele, the electric guitar, then the second guitar plugged into a different amplifier. And at the end there are some sound effects and a marimba track I decided not to export in the final version of the soundtrack. Um, it's a lot of tracks, so it won't be possible to go through all of them, but I will come back to the one particular sound later in this video in a detailed way, as there is a story connected to it. So at this time I had the main vision of the music's general tone, but before I started to produce anything I still needed to know how it should work in the game. Uh, at this point Against the Storm already had three species, beavers, lizards and humans, one biome that was a rainy forest, and different seasons. The idea of writing the music tailored to a specific species or biome was tempting, but those two solutions generated a lot of questions, like for example, what if someone plays mainly with one race, wouldn't it impose fatigue much quicker? How many species would we add in the process and how different should the music be? How much music should each species have and would I be able to write more music on time when the new species come to the game? The biomes had all the same problems and at this point we had no doubts that it would get even more complicated with time. So generally speaking season started to look like a wise choice because each gameplay on each biome regardless of the race is chosen always had three seasons. Even in the early stages of the game production, the drizzle season looked casually rainy and seemed ordinary and calm. Uh, the clearance season was very sunny with much lighter rain and felt like a big relief for the player. The storm on the other hand was very unpleasant, painful and visually dark. So the difference between them was very perceptible to me already and I felt I knew how to fit each of those with my music. There was one more thing though, I remember being afraid of the fact that the time in the game was relative. Players could stop the game and still develop the city or make the time pass faster whenever they needed, so practically depending on the player choices, the seasons had random duration. I was simply not able to predict how many tracks in a row would be heard and at which point exactly the tracks would stop. I recorded around 25 minutes of drafts and we implemented them to test it and the feedback was positive, the differences between the seasons worked well and on top of that we noticed that the random duration of the seasons wasn't bad at all. 
The music was drawn on shuffle from separate playlists for each season, while each season was changing the playlist duration in some way. It just worked to our advantage as it was diversifying the whole experience, and I was happy. Then another problem appeared. Uh, the team mentioned that the whole music felt a little too narrative and it was telling too much story, which apparently wasn't what we really needed in the Roguelite City Builder. Uh, the music was simply distracting us from playing the game. Later in the process I realized that the game simply felt slower than the music that I wrote. I slowed the drafts down by around 50 to even 80% and gave it a try. So here's what the difference looked like. Here's the version with a faster track. And here's another with the slower one. So after being slowed down the music seemed to fit the scene much better and moved the background and as a bonus we gained around 10 minutes of gameplay music with one simple trick so I was doubly happy. Now I promised I would come back to one particular sound so here's the quick story about the whistle. In the early stages of working on music drafts one melody popped into my mind while I was cooking and at the same time listening to the drafts from the other room. Uh, the keyboard in my studio was disconnected so while waiting for my dinner to get cooked I just ran to the studio and whistled the melody to the microphone in order not to forget it. Uh, later after listening to the new melody a few times I felt like the whistling sound itself added some fresh twist to the draft I worked on and I didn't want to have a clearly recognizable human whistle in the tracks as it sounded cheesy as a choice but trying to make it a little more interesting I copied it and changed the transposition of one track to minus 12. Uh, after I added reverb and balanced the volumes between those two it started to sound a little like an inaccurate vocal of some kind. Uh, the team liked it, it added a mysterious feeling to some of the tracks and that's how the melody whistled quickly into the microphone stayed with us to the end. Let's move to the sound part. I wanted the ambience loops to play a big part in the soundscape and complement the music in the background. The game was about the rain, its type was changing each season and it was visually exposed in each part of the game so I decided to try to keep the rain present sonically everywhere. Uh, of course, I was afraid of a few things, the rain sound could cause fatigue even faster than other sounds especially since for some people the rain itself can be depressing and the sound is humming. So, I knew it had to be carefully balanced with the music and sounds in order not to overwhelm the full scene, but on the other hand, try searching for relaxing rain sounds on YouTube, that's what I did in the first place. There's a lot of videos like this and they are super popular. For many people the sound of rain is relaxing and even helps to focus them on work or studying, so I decided to give it a try. So I started to test it and it turned out that it wasn't annoying for anyone on the team and in our feeling it was making the whole forest scene alive so I started to experiment more and I connected the ambient speed to the game speed so when the player accelerated the game it sounded a little different. I also set the speed to zero at pause so whenever the player stopped the game to focus on what to do it stopped raining while the music was still playing in the bargain. So the music was simply telling the player that the game was on, but the world he was building was quiet because it wasn't moving. This also meant that ambience wouldn't be present in the game all the time, leaving some space for the music to be in the front once in a while, which made the soundscape even more and gave more occasions for the player's ears to have some rest from the rain. So the final versions of the ambience consist mainly of my field recordings. I recorded various forests, birds, winds, thunder, uh, various types of rain from different distances and many others. These vary between the seasons and each biome has its own set of ambiences, meaning that together with the speed changes there are dozens of variants of the rain itself that you can hear while playing. This diversity together with a decent volume balance was what helped us to keep the, the rain present all the time without imposing too much fatigue on the players. So even though we already had a 
bridge background, I still needed different game aspects to be more interactive and the whole soundscape to be even richer. Uh, I ended up implementing more than 300 different sound effects, so let's split them into two categories and try to quickly see how they work in the game. The first category is informative sound, so all the UI clicks and all the ones that signalize something to the player, like for example opening and closing the banners, clicking the buttons, getting new orders and fulfilling ones, accepting new villagers, building, rotating and destroying the buildings, opening different glades, and many more. The second group consists of all the additional sounds that complement the soundscape in different ways. Some examples are having the fire fired up in the hearth, opening different buildings, gathering resources, different glade even sounds, marking the trees and unmarking them, woodcutting sounds that vary between the tree types, and many more. During the process I spent hours recording the sounds of cutting wood with a saw, throwing random objects on the floor, shaking plants, shouting and doing many other things that my neighbors possibly hate me for, but I think it was worth it, as even though part of the sounds weren't really necessary, it surely made the soundscape much more complex and helped with the possible fatigue problem too. So now I already had music, a lot of different rain noises and just added hundreds of sound effects to the game, but on the other hand I always liked the characters in games like Stronghold, Age of Empires and Sims in terms of how they were reacting vocally when clicked or sent somewhere. Uh, that was the starting point for the voice acting for the game. The problems I saw from the beginning were I didn't want the same sounds to repeat too often. So, and so. Uh, uh, we were planning to have at least three different species in different genders, six variants, we probably had to take into account. And we planned to localize the game to different languages. And I still wanted to do it all in-house. Uh, at this time, the pandemic was one of the additional reasons for it too. So, it looked like a lot of work, so I had to think about how to make it simple. To avoid localization problems, I came up with inventing different languages for each species, so those could be universal for each player. During the process, I wrote the whole list of random phrases inspired by Esperanto, Romanian languages and some random Polish books, and tried to come up with the voices in front of the mic while reading those out loud. Uh, I think it's possible I recorded around 8,000 phrases with different voices and mood versions just to end up with around 50 final files for each species. My whole plan seemed to work nicely until I was done with all the male characters as I simply realized that I wouldn't be able to do all the female characters even half as good as, as the male ones. Uh, as my girlfriend was just sitting in the next room, I got an idea and decided to ask her to help me. She had no experience in this kind of work, but I suggested uh, she could try repeating all the phrases recorded to male villagers uh, with her own voice. Long story short, we did a few tries and edits and after adding the effects it was done. The voices were better than mine, she did a great job helping me with all the female characters that appear in the game and the process stayed in-house, so I was super happy about how it went. So, 
summing it all up, the lesson learned while working on against the storm was that while trying to make the whole experience as rich as possible, it was also crucial to understand what resources and limitations we had in the first place, as planning the work can make those limitations work to your advantage. And that's it. I hope you liked it. Uh, we're still developing against the storm, so don't forget to come by to our Discord channel, especially if you hate the rain sound or my music and want to share it with me. Uh, if you made it to the end, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for listening. Cheers! Hello, I'm Arthur, I'm indie developer working on Jupiter Moon's mecha card battling roguelike game, where you play as mecha pilot. Music for Jupiter Moons was inspired by science fiction series and movies like Exp Expanse or Blade Runner, uh, electronic and space opera with some instrument in the background. Uh, I'm doing most of the work on the project, uh, game design, programming and sound effects. Uh, my friend is helping with the graphics and my wife is helping with uh, game marketing. The soundtrack was created by artist named Crosspulse. I designed sounds so the player will immerse himself in the role of mecha pilot. You will see electronic uh, working sounds or crack sounds, large servo mechanism sounds that mech will produce, uh, wave, different weapon sounds, damage to force field or ar uh, mech armor has different feel and so uh, uh, sounds differently than to the health. So you can accurately distinguish what is happening during a uh, battle by listening to game sounds. For non-combat parts we are aiming for little mystery and space feels that you will feel a little uneasy by being in space shopping uh, on space stations or traveling into different moons of Jupiter. Music is more live, rhythmic, but not too fast. Game is turn-based, 
and battles are pretty static, we tried to match music tempo to typical player behavior uh, of playing cards and in turn and waiting for enemies to do their actions. Thank you for listening and I hope you will enjoy our soundtrack. Bye!
Well, hello everyone. I hope that you're having a fantastic time. Project Warlock 2 is in early access with almost 200 reviews on Steam, so please do help the devs get to 200. World for Two is on sale right now. Jupiter Moon's Mecha has a demo available if you'd like to give that a try. And you can wishlist Against the Storm on Steam right now to support the developers. All right, we are now more than halfway through the show. Production has told me that if I keep on slipping up, they will cast me to the Shadow Realm. I am your host, Hans, and together we will be exploring audio design and music in games, right here in this cozy, very real room. Save and Sound is a way to celebrate the people behind the delicious sounds and music that you've been hearing tonight. By the way, where are you watching this stream from? Your couch? Your bed? Or maybe where you're supposed to watch streams? Right on the toilet. Let me know, chat. Up next, some wonderful segments made just for Save and Sound. Toem, a hand-drawn adventure game where you can take pictures to uncover mysteries of the magical world. Uh, they're doing an audio deep dive and a special band performance in the second half of the video. Then, much to the audience's surprise, we will have Rain World, uh, exploring its sound design and talking a little bit about Downpour. And we'll end the content block with Season of the Warlock, a magical point-and-click title showcasing its lovely orchestral soundtrack. That's all uh, you'll get from me now, and I'll talk to you all very soon. Bye-bye now. Hi, I'm Marcus, and I'm here with my colleague Victor. Yes. And together we are Rumsklang, yes. the audio team behind Toem, yes. the fantastic photography game. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So let's get stuck in. Yeah. So about the ambience. Where did you go to record all those beautiful sounds? Uh, yes, so I think ambience was a big part of Toem mm. and the creating this very chill and calm and relaxing feeling. And the, a goal for me was that uh, you should be able to play the game both with music and without. Right. To kind of really, you know, sit down and relax and take in the atmosphere. Since it's uh, Toem is set in Scandinavia and inspired by Swedish towns, I think I wanted to capture that uh, essence of Swedish nature. Yeah. Uh, so I went uh, to a national park here in Skåne, where I live, and recorded um, a lot of like forest sounds mm. uh, and a lot of kind of creeks and water and small waterfalls and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so that's a big part of uh, what the ambience is in, in Toem. <laughs> Was it as much fun to do these sounds as yes. they appear? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the best parts working on uh, the entire Tone project was that uh, Lucas and Niklas, the, the, the main devs, gave us uh, completely freedom to just fool around and be weird and be quirky. Mm. So that, that was a lot of the sound process. Mm. Uh, I think I tried to do sounds that when I showed them to the rest of the team, my I wanted to see their reactions mm. and if they laughed I I knew it was good <laughs> 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 
The robot farts, or the mis malfunction. Or yeah, that, that took me way too long to yeah. <laughs> come up with the concept of uh, world icing. So basically you take a... Um, uh, you take a speaker and you put it in an acoustic environment and then you record that acoustic environment. Uh, so what I did was to take a portable speaker and then put on the best uh, fart sample I can find and then put that speaker inside a metal pot mm. and just cranking the volume as mm. much as possible. So it really kind of vibrates and resonates. Yeah. So it's really like, you know, fart trapped inside a, can. a, a robot. Yes. Bum. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Exactly. There was a nice feature in the game, uh, letting the players choose what they want to hear. Yes. Yeah. The fantastic hike lady. Yeah. It's a great, uh, great concept. Yeah, definitely. Because, yeah. because like, there are non-diegetic music in the game as well. Mm -hmm. And then after you discover the tunes. You can choose to put them on whenever you want, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's also a, a part of the entire design of Toem that it should be a, an adventure, and you're you're like having your gear with you, and you you're on your own adventure. Mm. So you have your own music, and you can choose uh, which soundtrack you want to have. Yeah. And uh, that's really a brainchild of of uh, Lucas and Niklas as mm. well, and uh, it's managed with a programmer instrument. Um, mm in F mod so it's all all kind of controlled from unity right and then you have all the kind of UI samples of the cassette player uh, that I've just recorded with my own cassette player at home yeah. and uh, trying to just be retro and classic um, nostalgic very nice. feeling yeah very nice I think the UI part was the first part we, we started doing with the sound mm. and just trying to get that right because you're gonna do be so much in the UI environment. Yeah. Uh, so the camera is kind of take on a classic Polaroid uh, vintage camera. So also kind of very vintage camera sounds uh, that I've recorded and the classic Polaroid printout sound and. Uh, but also make it a bit toyish, so mm. I, I kind of blended it with some more comedic elements mm. and um, yeah, I think uh, the, the kind of button sound when you move from buttons, that's a small uh, drum that I found in a thrift shop mm -hmm. with some, yeah, a really tiny bongo drum, yeah. kinda. so you're just tapping that. Nice. So it kind of feels uh, me a little bit musical and rit rhythmical mm. uh, in a sense. Very nice. Tell us about <laughs> how did you do it? How did you do? How did you come up with all those voices? And like, since it's not a language, it's what is it? Since there's so many characters and, and the game is about, you know, traveling and exploring and helping the com community, mm. I really wanted to have the feeling that every person you meet is uh, unique and has a personality. Mm. So that's why I kind of wanted to make a lot of different voices and dialogues. Yeah. What we did was to have uh, a generic script that uh, I, I spoke and uh, also another voice actor called Anna Christofferson. <laughs> Um, so we read the same script and we just did very kind of over the top Swedish and Scandinavian accents mm. and uh, then I ran it all through a um, patch I made in Arturia Pigments Oh, ska du gå på äventyr vad kul So uh, basically the patch how it works it's uh, uh, a bunch of random randomized modulators inside uh, the pigments patch uh, so I could just drag in the uh, the big sample um, of um, the one take yeah exactly yeah. the one take of yeah. the dialogue with the different ac accents and then it kind of randomizes both the playback direction and a bit of a pitch and envelope mm. and then I've also put a formant filter and some effects mm. on there to kind of make all the uh, dialogues cohesive mm. since we we also threw a, could throw, throw a bunch of like animal samples in there as well mm. and they would also have the same characteristics mm. 
so to fit everything inside the same world yeah in a sense great work I you mean, too marcus yeah I thanks mean, i mean yeah. i uh, yeah i'm yeah sure. well it was it was a good project yes it was i i want to say uh thank you uh something we made yes you know if if you if you need a game uh call them yes they're, they're available. available yeah take care <laughs> <laughs> bye <laughs>
Hey, what's up guys? My name is James and I'm the audio director for Rainworld and the upcoming Rainworld DLC Downpour. Uh, and I'm gonna take you through a bit of the audio work that we're doing here these days. Uh, this video has three parts. First, a little primer on the original Rainworld soundtrack and the procedural music systems that we used for that. Uh, then you'll see me collaborate with my co-writer Lydia on a new atmospheric track for Downpour. Uh, and then after that, you'll get a little sneak peek at the new music that we'll be presenting from some new composers on the Rainworld DLC as well. So I hope you guys enjoy. Peace. Hello. Let's talk about some Rainworld audio. Much of the audio world is naturalistic, ambient sounds. But we also have procedural music events. Layers of music fade in dynamically depending on how dangerous the situation is. Then fade out as the danger decreases. Here, there is a lizard in the room, but it hasn't spotted me yet, so the danger isn't very high. And now that I'm safe, the music fades out completely. We call this the threat music system. To keep this from getting repetitive, we shuffle the different audio layers when the next threat event comes. Here is an example of what four or five threat layers combined sounds like. This rarely ever happens in the game. Dance this look at. But threat music isn't the only music heard in Rain World. There are also more typical music events, of course. They occur when the player is entering a new area or to convey a certain mood. This track is a theme I wrote for these garbage worms. They have a chill vibe. Unlike the threat music, this follows the player for a certain distance, or until the music ends. Hey, what's up guys? My name is James. Hi, I'm Lydia. And we are the composers for the original Rain World soundtrack. And today we're gonna to be doing a new track for the Rain World Downpour OST. Uh, this track is from the Elf series, which was sort of inspired by like monks singing, like tube and throat singing, like, oh. Is that <laughs> offensive to monks? Oh, maybe we shouldn't <laughs> do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's inspired not by monks, but by the sound of wind rustling through canyons. 
Canyons can't be offended, right? Right, they can't. They can't like post on Twitter like angrily. Canyons can't post on Twitter, as far as I know. Yeah. So we're gonna be recording a simple melody. Lydia doesn't think it's a melody. No, it's only two notes, so. Or, <laughs> it's a, a couple of notes. <laughs> we're gonna highly uh, sophisticated piece of Ooh. equipment, which is not at an We're gonna take th this some melodic material from Lydia over here, and we're going to pitch shift it around. Melodic material is better. Melodic material. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like content. <laughs> so we're, we're gonna take this stuff and we're gonna sort of um, a, a, assign it to some keys and like drop it by three octaves and put some weird stuff on it and you'll see what happens. So let's see what happens. Lydia, do you have some deep inspiration that you'd like to share with us? Oh yes. Alright, let's hear it. <laughs> Alright, let's see if we can capture it on here without it feeding back and hurting all of our ears. Mm. Perfect. Haunting. Let's see what it sounds like. Lovely. Creepy. <laughs> I think that's what, that's like... Some spooky sounds. Right. You could see this in a canyon. Sure. At night. A canyon. All right. So as you can see, I already sort of have the software all lined up for some weird brain world music. I honestly, I had thought that we would probably have to do like a couple of takes to get exactly what I wanted, but Lydia is so good, she nailed it in one take. Woohoo! Get those two notes. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to mess around with this and I'll show you some of the results of this um, in right now. Hey again. So one of the other things I'm doing right now is mastering the audio and soundtrack for Rain World Downpour DLC, our new project. Um, as it was originally a mod, the tracks here are from a bunch of different composers uh, in their bunch of different various recording environments, etc. So what I'm trying to do is to run all of their tracks through the original Rain World signal chain and the processes that I use to master and stuff like that, so that the tracks from the new composers sound as close as we can get to the original tracks by the original composers, myself and Lydia. And as you can see here, we also have this track LS8, which you heard us uh, composing a bit of in some of the previous videos. So what I think I'm going to do is to play us out with one of my favorite tracks from this new batch and we can all jam out together while I adjust levels and stuff like that. All right, thanks.
Hi, this is Carlos Martin Jara, and I am the music composer for the video game called The Season of the Warlock. Well, I still remember when I got the call for composing the soundtrack of this wonderful game, and I remember that it really gave me chills right away because I've always been a fan of adventure games, and uh, since I was a kid, I remember that one of the first games that I played was the Monkey Island and all the LucasArts games and everything, and it, for me it was almost surreal to, to be able to compose a soundtrack for these kind of video games here in, in, in Spain. So. I was really, uh, really happy to be in call for, for this, for doing this soundtrack. Well, I still remember when we started to talk about the soundtrack and the video game itself. When I, I took a look to the video game and to the style, it reminds me a little bit to Lovecraft and Vincent Price and Edgar Allan Poe. And it all started to resound in my mind and it helped a lot to create the soundtrack that you are going to listen in the, in the video game when you are playing it. This night onward, you shall bear my curse. Burn him! Well, the first thing that I did when I started to work on the soundtrack was trying to find a good main theme that defines this amazing world, the world of Groldavia, actually, and the main character, which is called um, Alistair. And I remember that I spent some time just looking for the perfect track of, or the perfect melody that suits and fits the game and that it's going to be with you uh, through all the time that you are going to be playing. So I'm going to play a little bit of this track for you so you can just uh, take a listen of how it sounds. Well, but not everything is in the main track, actually, in the main theme. You have different, different tracks composed for different situations, for different characters, for different um, uh, emotions, different backgrounds. And as a composer, I'm always trying to, to, to fit everything. It's like a huge puzzle. And I'm always, always composing music for, different, uh, for all different kind of elements. Now we have a different track, it's called the, the Town Square actually, it's, it's like based uh, kind of an, in a Venetian waltz, something like that, and it's something that we, we I use a kind of harmony which is a little bit aggressive in order that, that you can feel like you are in a town, very peculiar town, it's not something that, well you want to be there but it's something that you can be aware that something is always happening something like that for example and you can listen that the Boudouins in, 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 in a particular uh, um, in a particular moment of the track uh, do this it is something almost uncomfortable to hear but something really uh, really special for me Thank you. 
So now I'm going to play for you another different theme, uh, which is composed for a character called Bosco, who is a hunchback, uh, a bell ringer in the church, actually. And when I composed this track, I was trying to, to think about this character who is a little bit uh, walking in an awkward way, you know, it's something that even the, 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 the main thing that you are going to listen is these things in the, in the low uh, strings in the orchestra. tries to, to, to emulate in some way that kind of awkward walking. And after that we have this melody. Which is more melodic and it's a big contrast with that low, uh, low pizzicato strings. So this melody is more smooth and, and adds to the character something new in contrast to that kind of walking. very lucky to get invited to the Mosma Festival, which is uh, a festival uh, focused on film music and video game music inside the film festival of Malaga. And we did a premiere of, the, or a, of a suite of the soundtrack of The Warlock, actually, and it was very, very great, a very great experience because we got uh, the opportunity to work with their orchestra and they performed it in a very beautiful way. And it, it, it was a, like a huge premiere, the, a world premiere in Malaga, and we were very lucky to, to be there and we really enjoyed it. Well, talking a little bit about the, the not only the creative process of of composing, but the technical 
typical one is that uh, when you are doing that is that I compose the music in my house uh, using Cubase, which is a professional um, uh, DAO, a professional program that we a lot of composers use. But the thing is that after that, I, I hire an orchestrator. Uh, the, 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 the main thing that the orchestrator does is to, to put everything that I'm writing in a score uh, for the players to, to, to read and to play something, to play the music. So after that, we go to a recording studio and we heard like, I, I think they were like 40 piece orchestra or something like that. It's something like that, something between 40 or 60, I don't remember exactly. But we have a very, very huge symphonic orchestra to record the soundtrack. And after that, um, we spend a lot of time um, selecting the perfect takes in order to, to give you the perfect product and the perfect, uh, the most valuable takes. Because when you are recording, uh, a soundtrack like this, you can spend a lot of time in the studio, and I'm talking about days and dates, and the thing is that you have a lot of different takes, maybe hundreds of takes for each track, which is, which is unbelievable and, um, and a huge amount of work. And you have to, to spend a lot of time selecting those tracks and do a little bit of editing to, to, to get the perfect one. And after recording the soundtrack and do all the editings and everything, selecting all the tracks, uh, you start the mixing process, and uh, for this game we hired Jose Binader, which is, which is an amazing uh, music engineer with tons of experience, and he's been working, I don't know, maybe for 60 years, or something like that, and has been recording orchestras in, in, in different places, in London, and in, in LA, and, 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 and all kinds of countries in Europe. So when you finished just one track, you get the feeling that you have been part of some amazing project, and some of the most a uh, static party project that I have been lucky to work on. We have recorded the soundtrack uh, with the Mathur String Orchestra in Studio Uno in Colmenar Viejo, which is a studio that is amazing. And I've been working here uh, for almost 10 years too, since I came back from LA and I started to record soundtracks all around the world. I found that this particular studio was the perfect studio that I could find in Madrid, and not only in Madrid, but in Spain, actually, to, 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 to do this kind of craft, which is very specific, and you have to be very uh, detailed in, and, and love what you do, and these, these people are amazing in that way. Uh, well, one of the things that I want to tell about this game is not only the, the kind of way, that, the kind of work that I'm doing, but the people that are, that are behind it, which actually for me one of the most things that, I, that I'm most amazed uh, because of is because they have been working in this game for almost 10 years. So it's something unbelievable that just two people could work on something for that amount of time. So I think that you are not going to notice the, the amount of hours that, you, that it's been put in this kind of game, but the thing is that you can be sure that uh, their minds are on it and, and the, the, their most creative parts are on this game and their, their energy and everything it's been put with a lot of love and energy again in uh, almost in every pixel so it's something that I really I'm not only like a, very happy to be able to work on this game but also an, I'm an I'm admirer of the producers Well, I hope that you liked the demo of this game, or should I say, my game. <laughs> and hey everyone, it's me Hans, I'm back. So, let's talk a little bit about what you just saw. Totem is on sale right now on the Save and Sound Steam page. We are actually featured on the front page of Steam, so it shouldn't be too hard to find us. Rain World is also on sale, so please rejoice for that. And Season of the Warlock has a demo available. You know, buy the games and the soundtracks, try out the demos, support the developers. Making games is fun, 
but it's also incredibly difficult. So please do not hesitate to throw your credit cards, your coins, your cash, just straight at the screen right now. Don't worry about how it works, just trust me on this one. So this is almost the last block that I'll be presenting for you tonight. Uh, it's been incredibly fun to all talk to you on chat, and I think you're going to love what is up next. A charismatic and almost spiritually lifting performance by Kazakh for Everhood. Everhood being a great dance battle, narrative, mind-twisting game. Then unpacking, where some gameplay will be showcased, alongside some very insightful takes of its audio design. After that, Koromon, a modern take of the classic monster-taming genre, opening your eyes into its soundtrack design. And then we'll end the content block with Nitro Kid, a roguelike deck builder set in the neon 80s a little bit like this very room. They'll be showcasing the game soundtracks and mechanics. A big shout out to all of you in chat, and thanks for staying glued to your chairs, just like myself, and watching our little show. I'll see you very soon for the last block. Bye bye now.
Hi, Jeff. Hi, Ange. <laughs> Hello, everyone out there. We are from Witchbeam, the indie developer that made the game Unpacking. We were responsible for all of the audio in Unpacking. We're going to do a little video here about some of the behind the scenes, uh, tricks of the trade, little secrets about how we put all of the sound together. So, Jeff. Yes, Ange. What is Unpacking? Well, let me tell you. Unpacking is a Zen game about the familiar experience of pulling possessions out of boxes and fitting them into a new home. It's part puzzle, part decoration. You create a satisfying living space while learning clues about the life you're unpacking. Over eight different house moves, you gain a sense of intimacy with a character you never see and a story you never told. Okay, and so what were some of the challenges that we came across when we we're, when were doing the audio on this? From the very start, we realized that the game was a narrative-driven story where you have no dialogue, you never meet the character, and the entire story is told through the places she lives, her belongings. In fact, the unpacking of the belongings is the entire gameplay. Mm -hmm. So. I think we knew that it was going to be really dense in terms of foley sound and ambient sound to really create an immersive environment. It's such a chill game. There's so much space to hear a lot of detail in the sound. And it was a nice juxtaposition to the pixel art, because the pixel art is sort of impressionistic, you know what I mean? And there's sort of a bit of missing visual detail, and that's the charm of pixel art and for it to sound really real. Mm, exactly. uh, so the, those two paired together worked really well. One thing that defines um, the feel of a house that you're moving into is the sound of the environment around it. And that might be the sound of the suburbs that you're in, or maybe the house is downtown. And so actually the environmental sounds is traffic and horns and cars, right? But it can also be the sound of people walking on the, the, the floor upstairs. Tim, the programmer on Unpacking, added the concept of the time of day. So say in the initial level, the child's room, imagine they arrived late morning and starting moving into the house. And as you're putting stuff away, the afternoon starts to happen, like at about 3 p.m. to give that sense of time of day from an audio point of view. I added the sound of a, of a school letting its kids out, and all the kids are, are going home from school, so you can hear the school bell. Uh, you can hear a neighbor starts to mow their lawn and turns on a sprinkler, and it's all really subtle. I mean, the idea was not to make this super obvious, but if you, if you stop and listen, you can hear the environment sort of evolve as the time of day changes. So, and the foley in unpacking was such a huge, massive task. Uh, but does everybody know what foley even means? That's a good question. Foley is the reproduction of everyday sounds in movies and TV and games. We knew that uh, foley was going to be fundamental to unpacking because it's such a huge part of the gameplay. 
Like what were, what were some of the numbers like that we were looking at? Mm. There was 500 items approximately, 15 different surfaces. We wanted to have about 10 variations mm. so that it really sounded natural. So yeah. the simple math was 75,000 yeah. individual files that needed to be recorded, processed and edited and implemented. And it was, was way too, too much. much, yeah. Uh, so the challenge for the Foley really was coming up with some really cool ideas for how to get that number down mm. while still keeping this beautiful organic variance and breadth of sound. There's different, say, coffee cups in the game. And rather than going, okay, we need this kind of coffee cup and this kind of coffee cup and this one, uh, we realized that we could record something called ceramic and we had like ceramic light uh, medium and heavy and by doing that and sharing those sounds amongst anything that was made out of ceramic we didn't have to record nearly as many items but there was something else we did to make use of the generics an example of that is our pencil holder and no matter what surface you put it on the pencils rattle we had just thought we would have to record those items across all 15 surfaces until we came up with the brilliant idea that we could break that up into two sounds and use our generics. So if we do that with, with the pencils, got our generic, it's already recorded on 15 surfaces. And then we just recorded the rattling of the pencils once. It's a separate sound. There are two sounds played at once. Yeah. One is the cup being placed down, and then the secondary sound, the sweetener, rattling. Is the pencils rattling. Yeah. Once we realized we could do that, we could also make those things shake. Yep, and uh, that's actually a, uh, one of my favorite things to do in the game. Pick up an item and give, give it, it a little shake. Give you it know? a good shake. Um, and we put a, a lot of time into getting that right on the technical side. Uh, we configured it and programmed it quite complicated, but in the end, it makes it feel really natural because we're, we, we're detecting how hard are you shaking it. It's very satisfying. Like, you have a very satisfying sound in there. What was, was your favorite in there that was? Uh, my favorite's the hot water bottle. Yeah. When you shake the hot water bottle, it makes you feel like it's winter and it's all cozy and you're getting ready to go to bed. It brings that world to life. Now we're going to get into some really nitty gritty tech Kinda nerd stuff. Nerdy stuff, yes. Um, I love nerdy stuff, especially to do with game audio. One of the layers of putting audio into a game is the audio implementation. And an example of that is um, adding sort of 3D effects to things. Or to clarify, uh, positional audio is also what it's referred to. And a good example of that in the game is when you turn on a music player and it's playing music and then you change rooms in the game, the sound of the music gets uh, quieter, it gets panned over to like the right or left speaker, uh, it gets muffled sounding like it's going through the wall. And it really gives you that feeling like you're in a big house and the sound is happening in that room really far away. And then when you finally move back into that same room, it gets nice and clear and loud again. So moving away from turbo nerd sort of <laughs> mode um, and on to music and the soundtrack. The first thing was to find a style of music that was gonna gel with the pixel art. And I think the obvious choice there was to go with a chip tunes kind of style, uh, get those, those square waves going. I named the songs after the bookmarks in, the, in this person's life. When she moves in with her roommates, that song's called Friends for Life. When she moves in with her first partner, uh, I called that song Infatuation. The main thing it's trying to do is support the narrative and what is happening to our main character uh, throughout her life. Each level has a music player, while the background music represents sort of the high level, uh, the music player represents the kind of music she's into at that any given time. Which is ultimately also tied to a sort of year. Yeah, and genre. A genre yeah. of pop music. Yeah, of that time. Of that time, yeah. yeah. I quite liked uh, putting the sound of the different consoles 
in the game in the game uh, not only the, the console machines themselves but then also um, we created a bunch of games that don't exist There is a little preview of uh, the next upcoming uh, Witch Beam game. The game is called Tempopo. Uh, so that's uh, something to look out for, actually. Sneak peek. A little sneak peek. So we're wrapping up now because we are starving. Absolutely starving. We've been talking about food in between all these takes this whole time, and you won't believe the kind of pizza we're about to make. <laughs> <laughs> so you feed me something to get me going on that. <laughs> like a cheeseburger. <laughs> it's funny that some of the things that you want all have the word cheese first. Cheeseburger, mm. cheesecake, mm. just cheese. I'm a cheesy guy. Smoked cheese. Mm. You noticed I bought some? I did notice you bought some. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you ready? Have we ordered the pizzas yet? Smoked cheese pizza. Cheese. Cheese pizza. <laughs> Smoked cheese pizza. Ooh. With pepperoni. Ooh. <laughs> oh. All right, Jeff, I think that's about it. I think we've covered all the audio in Unpacking. Yep, I agree. That was a lot of fun kind of revisiting it all. Feels really good to share uh, with you guys, and I hope you liked it, and um, we'll be talking to you soon. See ya. This is David Vasca, I'm a music composer for games and I've had the pleasure of making music for Cormon and it's a pleasure as well to be here today on Save and Sound and today we're gonna talk a little bit about the work that I've done for Cormon and mainly we're gonna be talking about the main theme of Cormon. Mainly we're gonna be talking about the main theme of Cormon. That sounds funny but it's true and you might be thinking, dude, are you gonna spend 10 minutes talking about one track? No, 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 that's the interesting part. The main theme for Coromon is not just one track. We could say that the entire soundtrack of Coromon is the main theme. I'm gonna explain what I mean. And first, let's listen to the actual track that we consider to be the main theme. This is the main theme. There's a little intro here, and, and this plays on the on the main menu. And now this melody is important. So this is what you could call in more traditional terms the main theme of the game and when i started working on coromon and the developers starting started talking to me uh, about what the game is about i came up with a main concept for the game and when you think about it coromon is mainly about two things not not in terms of gameplay but even though gameplay is also in, in intertwined right with with aesthetics audio graphics right it's all in intertwined Cormon is mainly spiritually emotionally about two things friendship and adventure and i tried to create a, a melody that represents these two aspects of Cormon: friendship and adventure and you can see here in the main theme melody Okay, so listen to this. This is the melody that I talked about that represents friendship and adventure. And listen to the first three notes. This is a very simple 
what I like to call a happy chord. It's a major chord, but I like to call a happy chord for the people that don't know theory. It's a chord that just sounds happy. And the, these three notes represent the side of friendship. It's very lighthearted, very simple and down to earth. And we actually had a previous version of this theme that was more epic and orchestral and loud, but we thought, you know what, this this is not the spirit of Kormon. Kormon, and by the way, I probably should have said that at the beginning, Kormon is a monster taming game, a monster catching game, similar to Pokemon. You go on, you go on an adventure and you befriend all these creatures and you save the world. There's a lot of influence from Pokemon, of course, but there's also a lot of old school JRPGs like Golden Sun, and there's a lot of stuff like Legends of Zelda as well. So we thought the 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 theme, the, the vibe of Coromon is more of a lighthearted, positive thing. So we created this theme, which is you know, you know more quiet, more emotional. And these first three notes, like I said, represent the part of, of friendship. It's a very simple and very positive chord. Now let's listen to a little bit more. I've talked about the part of friendship. I'm going to talk about the part of the adventure in a little while. And we chose the electric guitar to, to carry this main melody because we wanted a more modern vibe. piano and here I'm gonna talk about the second half of this melody remember so we talked about the first three notes right the the part of friendship now the second part of this theme especially these last three notes here this is the part of the adventure and this this kind of interval here is called a, a fifth and is historically very associated with you know a, a call to adventure a call to battle it gives the theme a more adventurous and exciting feel so it's not just lighthearted, emotional and, and positive stuff so in a little while you're gonna start to understand why i said that the entire soundtrack of Coromon could be considered the main theme because this little melodic fragment here is spread throughout the entire soundtrack and you're, you're gonna see i'm gonna show you that this little fragment it serves as a guiding light for the players it tells players how they're supposed to feel and it reminds players even at the end of the game when there's several dozens of hours into the game why they went on this journey and it serves as, as a, a beacon, a guide uh, for the spirit of Coromon, for the spirit of the aesthetics of this work of art that is the game called Coromon. Now the next track is the track for the first town, first area that you visit in the game. So it's very relaxing and positive, but probably didn't know didn't notice something very important in the first few notes
these are the same three notes of the main theme that I talked about earlier. Uh, these are the three notes that represent the side of friendship, remember? So you see, the entire soundtrack is like this, and you probably wouldn't have noticed, and you probably didn't notice, I, I assume, that these notes were here, but they were here, representing that uh, side of, of friendship and there, there are other uh, elements later on in the soundtrack that will remind you of the side of adventure and there are other things in this track even in the, some of the background notes and the harmony that are reminiscent of the main theme as well It's funny because at this point your adventure hasn't started yet. It's the first area, things are not very serious yet, so it's very lighthearted. So that's why in this track I emphasized the three notes of friendship. But I didn't yet push the notes of adventure yet, because there's, there's no adventure yet. And here it comes again. next track oh the next track yeah we were talking about uh, you know the side of the friendship and the side of the adventure this is where the side of adventure is introduced and even the the track itself it's called call to adventure is the first area where there's combat you know your your adventure is really starting out in this area called radiant park So now it's the full melody, including the adventure part, and there's a trumpet. Which has a lot to do with a call to adventure, a call to battle, right? But... Things here are still not that serious yet, so you can tell it's a very chill vibe so far. next track is one of the most important tracks and like I told you before Coromon is a JRPG, a monster taming JRPG so there are turn-based RPG battles and in this kind of games usually the most heard track in the entire game is usually the regular battle track right so it's a very important track it needs to be very good otherwise it gets very annoying so here it is References to the main theme yet? Here, I'm 
gonna show you. So the melody goes like this. So right off the bat you can notice here the friendship fragment right at the beginning. And the friendship fragment is emphasized here because in a monster taming game when you're in a battle you might at the end of the battle befriend the monster that you're fighting against because uh, in these kind of games and certainly in Coromon you can capture monsters and you befriend them and they go along with you in your adventure but there's something special about this friendship melodic fragment here remember uh, on the first track when I told you that the friendship fragment is a happy chord right the the main theme was like this right and this battle theme is like this so this is the main theme the fragment the friendship fragment from the main theme and here on the battle theme so the friendship fragment in the battle theme was modified a little bit because it's still a battle you know so uh, you want to insert these these kind of fragments this these kind of motifs in a way that is not so recognizable and in a way that fits and adapts to the current situation of the game so this is no longer it, it's still very reminiscent of the friendship fragment but it's no longer a happy chord it's now a minor chord which it, which i like to call a sad chord there's a little bit more tension and it's more suitable for a battle and by the way i am emphasizing and showing to you all these fragments right all these references to the main theme so you might get the idea that the, the soundtrack oh, it, it's so repetitive, it's just the, the main thing being repeated over and over, but you wouldn't notice, uh, it, it, it's very subtle and you probably wouldn't notice if I didn't show you. It needs to be subtle, it's not like uh, we're just repeating the same song, the same melody over and over again. something cool in, in this track as well this is one of the this is one of the saddest tracks in the game and uh, because th this area has a lot to do with death and the afterlife so how to express friendship and adventure which are positive things in, in this context So this little disturbing flute that you just heard So how do you express uh, positive things like friendship and adventure? How do you remind the, the, the players of the, the driving factors of this journey without sounding completely, you know, out of context, out of the, the sad context of this track so if you pay attention closely this is the same rhythmic pattern of the main theme is without the notes if is without the life without the variation of the main theme but it's the same rhythmic pattern and the main theme is so when you take the the main theme And you remove the life of it. You 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 turn it into a flat line of lifeless, emotionless notes. You remove the variation, the 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 life of it. The only thing that remains is the rhythm, the most basic, the most primal aspect of music, which is rhythm. So you you're left with this. 
a lifeless memory, a, a dim image of what once was the friendship and adventure melody. So this is friendship, right? And this is adventure. friends, I could go on all day, but I bet you want to enjoy the other presentations from the other teams and the other composers in Save and Sound. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Save and Sound, for having me. Thank you to the developers of Cormon for believing in me and my music and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, and welcome to the Sound of Nitro Kid. I'm Julian, one of the producers of the soundtrack for the upcoming game Nitro Kid by Wild Boy Studios. Let's explain the main concepts behind the soundtrack. The game always had a unique vision and style that influenced the soundtrack. The tracks I composed were my interpretation of the world of Nitro Kid, imagining different scenes and characters. My idea was to capture the spirit of 80s synthwave while having a futuristic and modern sound, by merging the synthwave style with modern electronic music. This creates a hybrid style that makes the songs unique and pushes the envelope of what would be considered traditional synthwave. I've always had an affinity for music that does not conform to a specific genre. My music usually turns out high energy and very melodic. This shows in the soundtrack too. So the soundtrack integrates the style of different music artists and is influenced by different electronic music genres like synthwave, outrun, dark synth and cyber synth, while also having elements of house and trance. This gives it the needed variety while forming a cohesive picture. You can hear the variety also in the different moods of the tracks. Some are playful, some are serious, some are dreamy, and some are really intense. I made the decision to be bold and experimental while composing. My goal wasn't another run-of-the-mill soundtrack that loops endlessly in the background, but catchy, distinct and recognizable tracks players would like to listen to in their free time. So every track became a full-length song. This gives the gameplay a feel of ebb and flow, and some tracks only play on special occasions, like the boss fights, which gives them their own sound. The soundtrack has a few distinct themes. Imagine the scene of driving at high speeds in 80s supercars into the sunset of a futuristic neon-colored Miami, in an age where the 80s never ended. This theme of retrofuturism is present in many synthwave tracks and I try to capture it in the soundtrack, while giving it my own spin. The track you can hear now expresses it quite well.
other tracks that play mainly in the Mac floor are inspired by science fiction and cyberpunk. Machines have overtaken the world and humans have merged with machines to become more powerful. Cyborgs are marching through the streets of futuristic cities. The setting is inspired by 80s movies like The Terminator and Blade Runner. Gritty basses are at the forefront of the tracks, and the whole track sounds mechanical and robot-like. Let's take a listen. Cyberpunk sound gives the soundtrack variety and fits the mech floor well, as the opponents there are obviously robots, cyborgs and machines. These tracks have less melody and are more focused on the sound design aspect. Another theme is that of hope. The hero must overcome the odds stacked against them. In a futuristic dystopian environment, to save the mutant kids, they face many scary opponents, greater in number and in size, but still they must overcome all of them by steadily upgrading their skills and never giving up, even if the situation seems hopeless. The track now playing has a nice drive to it that symbolizes that the hero must push forward no matter what. It is high energy and has an element of danger to it. It tells the story of the hero facing the time police and their cyborg soldiers. There's no hiding from them. Because infinity has more power than the government, even the police is under its wing. Of course, the hero is outnumbered, but they must have hope and faith in their abilities to overcome even the direst of situations. The song implements an 80s guitar and then transitions to a trance lead. Let's listen. Man, I love those trance saws. The lead comes from the Access Virus TI hardware synthesizer that I used throughout the soundtrack. Its sound gives the synthwave tracks a modern touch. The next song I want to show you is called Infinity and plays on a mutant floor. It captures the evil and supremacy of the mega corporation quite well. Infinity rules over Neo Miami, guarded by their mercenaries and cyborgs. The hero must break into their headquarters, where they see firsthand that Infinity conducts experiments on humans that turns them into mutants. The eerie atmosphere and mysterious leads merge with industrial percussion and the driving bassline. As you may have noticed, these stories inspired me to create the music around them. 
Having distinct atmospheres for different parts of the story and the world of Nitro Kid was important for me. Thus, the final soundtrack contains songs with different flavors and moods. I also tried to match the music to the gameplay, so some tracks are more energetic while others are more laid back. Variety was one of the key factors in creating the soundtrack, as it can get stale otherwise. The other artists that contributed to it did a phenomenal job and added to the variety. I'm very happy with the result. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and my musical interpretation of the world of Nitro Kid. Making the soundtrack was a welcome challenge for me, as I come from a background in EDM and by creating for the game I gave a unique I made over 20 original tracks for this soundtrack and you some of them and stay tuned for the reveal of the other artists that contribute to the soundtrack. The full game will come out later this year on PC, but the demo is out now and if you liked what you heard so far, I highly encourage you to play it. Alright, thanks for watching guys and cheers. And welcome back everyone. This is going to be the last content piece. So thank you so much for sticking around for day one of Save and Sound. Uh, first about what you've just seen. Everhood is on sale right now and so is its soundtrack. Unpacking is available for purchase. Coromon is on sale, the soundtrack too. Nitro Kid has a demo available. So check out those games and wishlist them if you can. All right. So we have an incredible piece by Frostpunk and South of the Circle where the composers of both games talk about their inspirations and about how they approach audio design. There are two special soundtracks launched today available on Steam where they made covers of each other's music. So do check that out as well. After that, we will be taking a look at Project Arrhythmia with how the game came about and a lovely showcase of its soundtrack. So as I said previously, we'll be ending the show after this segment. This is the last time you'll see me tonight, um, but I'll be seeing you tomorrow for day two of Save and Sound, I hope, which is starting at 7 p.m. CEST, 10 a.m. PDT, right here. We have three more days of wonderful content, so tell everyone about Save and Sound. Your grandma, your children, your neighbors, even your ex. Just let them know what this event is about, you know? Um, I've been Hans, your host for Save and Sound. Stay safe, don't stare at the sun for too long, and uh, good night. Bye-bye. Hi, my name is Piotr Buschau. I'm a composer working for 11B Studios. Um, I work on Frostpunk, The Swear of Mine. You may also know me from the Witcher 3 Blood and Wine um, game deck or uh, Red Solstice 2. You can also hear my music in some of the movie trailers and TV shows. Hi, I'm Ed Critchley. I'm a music composer. I live in Brighton in the UK and I have worked with Luke in State of Play Games uh, for many years now. Uh, started with Luminous City 
and done inks recently, and of course, South of the Circle. When working on my music, I like to mix stuff, like the live stuff, uh, live orchestra, live uh, string quartets, some single instruments that are very specific for, for a specific genre. As with a lot of composers, I use a combination of instruments, uh, both uh, virtual and real. Something I'm really obsessed with at the minute is these transducers, which vibrate um, and whatever it's in contact with uh, becomes a speaker. I have one attached to the back of a, an old piano. I sort of ripped everything of the piano out and it's just the strings and the soundboard. And uh, that acts like a reverb unit, um, but obviously picking out the particular notes, resonant frequencies from that. And I have the other one that just roams around the studio. I have on a long wire and I attach it to all the different things and make lovely music out of it. Well, one of the most amazing things uh, today composers have is VST instruments that uh, kind of simulate the sound of real instruments. You can write for an orchestra in your home studio. Bring your laptop to, to, to your um, vacation and, you, you know, just work on headphones and write some music uh, this way. I found I was taking melodic themes that were originally for one thing perhaps about a political situation or danger or whatever, and then using that same motif to tell you about Peter's relationship uh, with parents or uh, romantic relationship and so on. I hope I've achieved that, that it's noticeable if you want to notice it, if you really concentrate, but it doesn't scream at you or uh, make too much of it, it's just reflecting the confusion in Peter's mind. I use a um, set of small motifs, um, like three, four notes, um, that, are, that were the base for the, the main theme. And for DLC, for example, I like to take these motifs, kind of reverse them, and this was kind of hidden in, in, the, in the soundtrack for the DLCs. And for example, for The Last Autumn, I think I used the, the original uh, version of the theme only once at the very end of the game, uh. which was because The Last Autumn was prequel. So it, it was leading to what happened next in, mm. in, in the original vanilla game. Some chords or small motifs on a piano, and I stretched them like a hundred times, and I made ambient sounds with it. So this is kind of the, the background of, of the music place for 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 the the live orchestra and, and quartet. So this was the the inspiration to to that was uh, was of course the, the setting of Frostpunk. How did you manage to get that sense of scale? I heard things you were doing and I thought, ah, <laughs> I could have done it that way. <laughs> it, was very, it's, it was very impressive. Um, you mixed together some big sort of almost trailer music type sort of dance. I hope you don't mind me saying so, like yeah. uh, with, 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 some, with strings, but then there's intimate uh, Melodic, you can you can hear a single instrument as well, and I thought it was fascinating. Cool. I mean, uh, this was the whole point of of the the soundtrack to to start small mm. and just grow with the game. Mm. Okay. Um, it didn't exactly turn out in the game uh, to just you know start with small ensemble or solo sure. instruments because some of the music is still randomized, you know, mm -hmm. to to get more mileage. Yeah, but that was the idea to start small and then just grow in, in instruments and to approach this final storm. I was, I was wanting to reflect Peter's isolation and he could feel small and in his own head, even when he's surrounded by a huge vista. And I, yeah. and, and I could hear similar things. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's interesting. just a similar idea. Yeah, yeah. but different approaches, you know, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah, that's cool. With South of the Circle, I decided to try and work from concept art uh, for the game and I had some recordings of the, the motion capture that they'd, they'd done so I could hear some of the dialogue and the voices and get an idea of the relationships between the characters which is incredibly useful but I don't know about you I, I found mm -hmm. I didn't want to 
play the game first. I wanted, I just wanted to get an idea of, of, of the general setting, uh, and of course, read the script, um, create the pieces of music as if I was writing the soundtrack, if you see what I mean, rather than the music for the game. That's slightly separate, separate things. You know, for Frostpunk, I did want to play the game first mm, to mm. you know to feel the the pacing yes. of it yeah um think i think that's very important especially for for a game that, that you will play for 20 30 hours yes yeah but i i do sometimes just try to push it back and uh, sit down and do drafts mm, mm. i guess you do the same it's, you know conceptualizing the the, the style of the music mm. this way it's interesting you say about the pacing. That that's that's very interesting. I think with South of the Circle, it plays. In fact, they're very careful about timing of dialogue and everything. So I, I would do as I was saying, but then the next thing would be even just to record screen captures of, of playing yeah, yeah, playing yeah, through. Yeah. So I was kind of scoring to picture really, mm -hmm. and then the last step is okay. Now of course this has to work. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, implement it into the game. I took the melody and I, 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 I changed the harmony um, as if I was writing it myself. So know, it's, it's another evolution of the micro theme. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, so with that, I, I just did a single take, uh, you know, off-grid uh, performance of the of my clunky piano. You've got some interesting things happening because of the harmonic changes you're making and the accidentals you're putting in. Um, and I thought, this is fantastic. You have so many themes that are complementing each other and reflecting each other and bouncing around. I thought, okay, I'm going to pretend that I'm writing uh, my own piece. It's uh, rhythmic, very much to grid, kind of like dance music with, without the bass drum, uh, which happens in South of the Circle a few times. You just get this pulse. Yeah. And, oh, this is a great idea <laughs> that I've sort of not really come up with. But it's, I really, really enjoy it. And I've, I've moved things from uh, things you've pitched up high, I've pitched down low, to, just to deliberately take it yeah. away from the original thing. But yeah, it's been it's been an interesting collaboration, even though we're working separately. You know, I, I, yeah. And yeah very, we'll see if you hate cool it. Ideas. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to, to listening to it. Uh, and likewise. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, we're not gonna get you know angry at each other. <laughs> no, yeah. well, we'll see. But I think it's a uh, yeah. it's a very exciting prospect to take someone else's work. I love um, the social interaction as well as uh, the creative one, um, but uh, there are times where it's my time to sit alone in a studio for a month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say that basically, at least for me, uh, writing soundtracks is writing my own music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, it, it's not very often that I have time to, to just do my own stuff just mm -hmm. for my uh, pleasure music for the game or whatever project I'm, I'm working on and it is just still my music it yeah. may be you know restricted a little, a little bit but they may maybe some boundaries they may be some structure that can find yes um, yeah. but but there's I, still a lot of me in there but I find when I'm doing my own work that I have to falsely put those boundaries yeah, on myself yeah, true because it's, it's nothing good if comes of total freedom. It's uh, yeah. it, creatively, I think. So, uh, and in a similar way, although thankfully the technical restrictions are no, no, no longer really apply in the same way, you still have the same thing. You, you have to create the right motion at the right time, or you have to um, tell a story in a certain direction. But this is this is this is great, isn't it? It's nice to have yeah. this focus. I, I, I love it, and, and experimented in uh, uh, working for 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 South of the Circle and, and other things. I've then taken into my personal work and thought, okay, this is great. These, these are very much equal uh, areas in terms of creativity. And it's, uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, maybe the way you work uh, sometimes, like try to detach from, from the game mm -hmm. and um, just work with a concept. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a way for you to work on your own music. Yes. It is your own music. It then becomes the, the game music. Exactly. Yeah, I completely agree. So now I would like to introduce to you our versions of each other's music, Frostpunk and South of the Circle, available on YouTube, Spotify, Steam and lots of other streaming services.
started. A short 15 second video uploaded to my personal YouTube in 2013. This was the start of Project Arrhythmia. At the time, I didn't realize the significance of it and that it would affect the course of my life over the next eight years. But before all that, let me introduce myself. Hello, my name is Pidge and I'm the creator of Project Arrhythmia. I started on Project Arrhythmia during high school. And at the time I was really fascinated with a lot of audio visualizations, different things like that. When I was introduced to the game OS while in high school with friends, I really was drawn to the idea of having a game that was reactive to music. However, the actual gameplay loop of OS wasn't all that fascinating to me. I found it to be pretty bland and honestly not that enjoyable. That's when I stumbled across a game called Battle Cube. Battle Cube is a small single level title made by Nifilis and Nifilis uh, released it and then basically abandoned the concept. And after emailing him and asking for permission, I actually was granted the ability to continue on the project. So I recreated it in one Friday afternoon and that's where all of this really started. While Cole definitely wasn't the first boss ever made in Project Arrhythmia, it was definitely the first that the community really adopted as a mascot for the game. I think a lot of new players don't really remember Cole all that much, but in the early days it was a pretty impressive feat. I definitely remember seeing this level and thinking, how in the heck was this made in the level editor that I created? Obviously, by today's standards, it's pretty uh, bland and low impact, I would say, but still, every single time I play it, I get a rush of nostalgia because there was really nothing like this before this level. It was also really an important part of the game because it was the first time that I really saw the potential in characters because before this, there was actually no characters representing Project Arrhythmia other than the player character, obviously. And that was an interesting issue because it actually created a lot of problems when trying to market the game. But I quickly realized that it was actually one of the greatest pros of doing it the way I did because with no characters, people were free to make their own. And they definitely delivered. Cole was just the start. There have been hundreds and hundreds of more characters added to the game over the years by other level creators. Now, enough of me talking. Let's get to a couple of my favorites.
Are you there? Are you real? Huh? I think you're virtual. Am I wrong? What are you?
Unfortunately, I've run out of time, and those are all the levels I can show you for now. But know there are thousands more in the Project Arrhythmia Steam Workshop. Each level is special and amazing in its own way, so I really recommend you give them all a view. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy.